second option. Create and launch a new 8.5% ABV wine in the UK. So again, low alcohol is kind of a key trend at the moment, being discussed, I'm sure, downstairs, and I'm sure amongst uh, yourself and your colleagues. So there's an increasing consumer awareness at the moment for, low, for a low alcohol wine. So from the health perspective, but also the government and a lot, a lot of initiatives coming through. But also on the other side is that consumers are a little bit unsure about low alcohol wine. <coughs> Also, there's a taste and quality challenge which needs to be addressed. And currently, it's a very low market share. Option three. A range of natural and organic wines in the Nordics and the UK. Again, natural and organic wines are kind of, kind of key talking points at the moment. Should this be one of your investments in the future? So again, there's an increase in consumer awareness of natural and organic products. There's a demand from retailers to find their point of difference, find their niche. Could this be it? But again, there is a risk that it is quite a small niche in the market. And it's not widely understood or appreciated, potentially, by other consumers. And the wild card option, option four. <laughs> Do you invest in real estate in Florida? So the US is showing signs of economic recovery. There's always long-term stability in property. But on the other side, is the market still got some way to drop? Okay, so what I'd like you to do now is in your table, split into two teams. You have to talk to each other, I'm afraid. On your tables, you'll find two envelopes. Could each team grab one of those envelopes, please? Okay, if I can have your attention again, please. Your attention again, please. In your envelope, you will find a summary of those four options. You will also find some gold coins. What I would like you to do in your team is to decide where you want to place your gold coins. You could decide to put all your investments in one basket, or you could decide to spread your bets. I'm going to just give you a couple of minutes, and in two minutes, myself and Diego will come round and collect your decisions. So please be as fast as you can, and I'll come round shortly. And away you go.
The scores on the doors will appear shortly. Um, in the meantime, I'd like to just sort of set the scene a little bit about thinking about the future here in the wine industry. Um, and to do that, um, we kind of need to sort of start at a, at a fairly high level, which is about why do we actually want to think about the future in the first place. Um, the, uh, uh, the science fiction author, um, whose name I'm going to mispronounce, called John Sladek, Sladek? Um, who uh, made a delightful quip, um, which I read on uh, my Google search the other day, which is, the future will be just like the past, only more expensive. Um, and I think it's kind of got a point, um, particularly in the wine industry. Um, the fact is that the future matters um, to us all, and, and in particular, it matters to us in business. Um, the problem that we have is it's actually quite a difficult place for us to go. I think for us, most, most of the future con uh, is uh, conceived of as basically the next two hours or the, you know, what my diary is telling me that I must do next. Um, and um, going beyond that is, well, quite frankly, outside of our comfort zone. Um, again, uh, in my uh, highly technical uh, research um, on the internet recently for, for this uh, talk, um, I came across a fantastic piece of work that's been done by the uh, executive editor of The Economist, um, and uh, he, he also edits The World In, you know, that series that, uh, of books, uh, and uh, just for a bit of fun, he decided to interview uh, a number of quite high-powered entrepreneurs and, you know, kind of quite withered people and see what they would say if you asked them, you know, what's the world going to look like in 2050? So. The common themes arising from this uh, study, which is an inspired piece of work and one I'm going to steal in the future, is um, aliens will be walking among us. Okay, this is common themes. You know, they did say other things, but mostly people said that. Uh, flying cars, a lot of flying cars. And then finally, robots, many robots. So essentially, you know, the, the stuff in the science fiction and not necessarily anything that's really tangible or thoughtful. The problem is that 2050 is a long way away, and we do not really have a frame of reference in which to kind of project ourselves into the future. If we were to think about it seriously, we would say, well, we're all going to be quite old, um, hopefully our children will still be looking after us, and hopefully the world will still be here. But beyond that, really, it's quite tough. The problem is that actually we need to think about the future. 
um, I found this um, very good quote. Oh, sorry, this is the, uh, the source. It's a, uh, actually another market research agency um, with a great uh, idea. Uh, and uh, if you want to go and have a look at it, it's uh, from gamesnational.com um, to read the, the, uh, the study in full. Um, the quote that I've come up with uh, is uh, from uh, a guy called Keith Weed, uh, who's the chief marketing officer at Unilever. He said this last month, um, which was you know, a sort of fairly bold statement, but one that sort of resonated with me in, in trying to think about this talk, which is we must, as in Unilever, I guess, but more generally, we collectively must get to the future first. We've got to be there before the other guy, the next people along, because if we are not, then they're probably going to eat the lunch that was destined for us, and we're going to have nothing. So getting to the future first is, is basically what this talk is all about. And then the question becomes, well, okay, how exactly do we do that? So, a lot of people talk about the future in books. I'm sure you've read some um, or heard these authors. Um, the piousness and the irritation with which they kind of confidently predict what's going to happen um, really upsets me, and I don't know whether it, it does anything for you, but uh, there's a lot of people out there who say they know what's going to happen next. Um, one of them is a man called Patrick Dixon, who is probably a very nice man, but he made a very uh, bold set of predictions um, some time ago in a book called Futurewise. It's actually a very good book. It certainly uh, caused, caused me to think a lot about um, actually what, what the future held for, for society as a whole and, and you know, um, our industry within it. Um, but this uh, statement caught my eye, uh, which was you know, written, let's face it, in 1998. So expect falls in DIY tool sales in all developed countries as cash-rich time poor stressed out people hiring expert help. Okay, you know, fair enough. He's made a call which is all about we're not going to want to put up that shelf anymore because we're just going to be too stressed out and cash-rich wanting somebody else to do it. So actually, let's see what happened to that prediction. Um, so that's 2001, which is uh, uh, the, the first set of data I can find. And bizarrely, here in the UK, the sales of DIY products and to, uh, of, of the services is almost exactly the same, about 11 billion pounds each. Okay, so we start at you know, e equality. If Patrick's right, we're going to see product sales fall, so that's the light blue bar, and the dark blue bar to services sales rise. So what happens? 2003. Oops, uh, wrong ones here. So product sales are up and services sales are down. Ooh, Patrick's prediction is not looking so good. Uh, 2005, whoops, <laughs> definitely not right. So they're going completely the opposite way. We're buying more drills and all sorts of stuff. And the services uh, aren't actually being used as much. Ah, 2007, well, what's going on here? Uh, services sales are still falling. Now product sales are falling too. Hmm, what's going on? 2009. Services sales are still falling, but product sales have fallen off a cliff. Why is that? Ooh, possibly we have a recession on our hands. People aren't spending very much money anymore. 2011, where are we at? Oh, it's exactly the same again. <laughs> I'm not making this up. The source, which is Lloyd's CSP, it's a report that just came out last week, is basically saying that in this 10 year period we're talking about, actually nothing has changed. The only thing that's changed is that we've had a rather nasty recession and people are just spending less on everything. So, so much for futurologists. Right, um, so, as a group, and in the very short time we have together, my job here is to try and get you into a bit more of a future mindset. Um, now, there are lots of ways one can do this, fantastic exercises that uh, uh, people come up with. Um, we've just got a very simple uh, seesaw here, as you can see, which is called the wonder and skepticism seesaw. Um, <coughs> on the one hand, you have essentially an exhaustive set of everything good that might happen next. You know, and next can be anywhere, um, as Simon was asking earlier, this is a one, three or five year question. Well, it can be a, a you know, one month question or it can be a 10 year question. It really, your time horizon really depends on what it is that you're trying to resolve in your own mind or in your own company's mind. So it's an exhaustive list of all the good stuff. So natural why, let's take an example of what we're talking about. Robert Parker comes out and says, this is the only way that wine should be made. Mm -hmm. wow. um, and he's still got some credibility in the market. Um, lower alcohol. Governments across Europe dramatically reduce duty on wines between 5.5% and 8.5%. Brilliant. Uh, China. 
the country's biggest TV soap carries a very positive wine storyline that runs for months, and it involves you know someone buying a winery and then you know making off with a great girl, or she's buying the winery and she finds the man of her dreams, and everyone lives happily ever after. And suddenly, people's perceptions of wine in China amongst people who watch TV and this you know, program is probably watched by 150 million people. They're transformed. Wow. Okay, so lots of good things that could happen. And then there's the sort of skepticism side, which uh, I think actually us in the wine industry can do quite well, quite, quite uh, frequently, uh, given any conversation I have. Um, so, natural wine, no one's interested in paying more. It's low margin, no one's going to buy it. Lower alcohol, consumers just don't like the taste. Well, you know, you can't sell something to someone who just doesn't want it. Uh, China, the wine revolution that we're hoping for actually just proves to be a fad, just like it did in Japan. So, let's just apply some of this wonder and skepticism to some data, because that's really the next stage. You've got the ideas in your head, what good things could happen, what bad things might happen. And actually what you're trying to do is to say, what's likely to happen? And to do that, you kind of need information. Now, the information I'm going to share with you here is from research that we do at Wise Intelligence. Partly, you're guessing this is the reason we're running this uh, seminar, which is a little bit of a sales pitch for us, but you know, bear with us. There may be quite a lot of information that sits within your companies. It could sit within the minds of your salesmen. It could sit within the guy who runs the accounts, because he's got you know, all sorts of interesting data that he probably doesn't share with you unless you ask him. Um, or it could sit within your customers. So it's a lot of information that you need to sort of bring to bear to try and say, okay, what could happen, and in fact, what will happen. So in this instance, I've just given you a, a set of data here, which uh, shows um, the, uh, the uh, buying behavior, as it will, uh, of uh, people in the various different categories of alcohol by volume. So at the top, you've got uh, the dark blue bar, which says, uh, these, uh, 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 these alcohol levels I have bought wine, and I will continue to buy wine, and this is a survey of 600 wine drinkers here in the UK, which we conducted in January. Um, as you can see, the big blue bar at uh, 11 to 13 and a half percent, and you wouldn't, you wouldn't be surprised by that, that's where most wine is sold. Um, slightly lower bar at 14 percent or more, there are some you know, people who like the bigger alcoholic wines out there, and consistently lower bars here at 6 to 10 and a half, and then at 1 to 5.5. Um, which is obviously where currently the low alcohol category sits because 5.5% is where the, ta the tax break ends in, in fact for um, what they don't call wine but they call it sort of a wine based product I'm never quite sure what um, there are also people who haven't bought the product um, and there are people who have bought it but are not going to buy it again so the people who bought it are not going to buy it again are the, the people the slightly lighter blue uh, the very light blue is I have not bought, but I am open to buying the idea, the product at this level. So what you're seeing here is, well, you know, there is obviously going to be a market for lower alcohol wine because there are some people who want to buy it there. It's not as big a market as it is for the wine that we currently consider to be in the mainstream of, say, 11 to 14 and a half. Um, but what we can do from this data is um, actually talk about numbers. Um, so we can extrapolate this data and say, well, there may be around 13 million people who have bought wine below 10.5% <laughs> and would consider buying it again. And that's an, a none too shabby number, really, when you think about it. That's quite a lot of people. Now, I grant you, what this isn't telling you is how often they might buy it. And so that's a different question, it's a different set of data, perhaps, that we need to consider. Um, but there are also 10 million people who are just frankly never going to touch this stuff no matter how much you dress it up. Um, and then there's sort of five million people who kind of go either way. So a reasonable, a reasonable opportunity, but to be quite honest, some of the other factors that are on your sheets that you were just considering may be more important than this, like will the government reduce duty? And can we figure out a way in which uh, we can make this product taste really good uh, as well as be lower in our So what will happen next? Back to our wonder and scepticism um, seesaw. Uh, consumers <coughs> do want to live healthier lives. They tell us that a lot in our tracking data. Those of you who run tracking service, probably you're hearing that as well. But what does that actually mean? We'll save that for the scepticism bit. Retailers are definitely interested in giving space to low alcohol products. It will be a question that we'll talk to uh, Andy about in, in a minute. 
Um, government may create this new low, low duty ban, ban. It is in their power to do so. Um, the fact is, however, we think, consumers actually prefer the taste of higher alcohol wines, at least for the moment. Um, they do see wine as a, a, a treat, and most of them tell us quite regularly that they actually would prefer to live healthier elsewhere. So maybe have a healthier breakfast, but when it comes to 8.30 at night and they want a glass of wine, they don't want diet wine. They want the real deal. And then actually retailers, um, less than, will uh, uh, list these products and then delist them just as quickly if they don't sell. Because in the end, you know, whatever they say, they've got to make the bottom line and they've got to make their shelf space work for them. So, uh, very quickly, uh, what were the predictions? So, can some teams, uh, uh, well, in fact, we have, we have the answer here. Um, so, in fourth place, with uh, 12 coins, we have the natural organic wine. Um, and this is obviously the wisdom of crowds. Third place, we have the lower alcoholic wine in the U UK with 20 coins. Um, very close to that, um, <laughs> this is brilliant. The winery in China comes second. <laughs> so that leaves <laughs> our runaway winner with 27 coins of Florida real estate. <laughs> okay, that tells you quite a lot, doesn't it, about the state of the wine industry. Um, excellent. <laughs> so, um, just to try and give you our sense of where this stuff's going um, uh, for, for, for the record, and then we will, we will move on. Um, for lower alcohol, we think that the government probably will create a new duty ban, but actually, being the government, they won't actually make it that much more attractive. And probably what they will do, um, and uh, Gavin Partington from WSTA um, is obviously trying to fight very hard against this, is in so doing, they will ramp up the duty on um, higher alcohol wines even more, um, which actually as an industry won't do us any good at all. Um, the category probably will grow, in part because uh, people like Andy will give space to it in, in, in the store shelves, but it's really no, not going to be a big deal. It's going to, we think it's somewhere between 6 and maybe 8% of sales by volume, assuming that there is some kind of duty break. Uh, natural organic, well, there are a few mainstream endorsements for it at the moment. Um, it, it remains a product that's difficult to explain and difficult to understand, and really it's only for the very highly involved wine consumers. Um, so we think it's going to be sub 1%. Um, of the uh, UK or Nordic markets. Um, and then um, China, well, <coughs> China's an interesting one because uh, you don't necessarily want to go up against these huge, well-funded domestic producers. At the same time, you also know that some of the wine that's being produced in China isn't very good. Um, so if you can produce really good wine and get yourself a consumer following, actually the exit play here is to get bought by Great Wall, Cheng Yu, or all of these really big uh, companies because they need not only your expertise but also your brand equity. Um, do you want to know the numbers for Florida real estate? <laughs> <laughs> I found them last night. So uh, this comes from the Remax Realty and it's the Cape Coral uh, Fort Myers area um, and it starts in 93. So in 93, the, the selling price, which is the light blue bar, was around uh, $85,000, um, so that's the left-hand scale there. Right-hand scale says the number of transactions, and there were about 5,000 transactions in this particular region. Um, 97, price is not moving very much. Uh, similar number of transactions. Ooh, 2001, something's going on. Price rises to 130,000. Transactions on the rise to about 6,500. 2005, what has happened here? We've got uh, the average selling price has virtually tripled. And the number of transactions has also gone through the roof. It's over 13,000. I don't know what's going to happen next, right? <laughs> so, <laughs> average selling price through the floor, back down to under 100,000. So back where it was in 1993. But look at the number of transactions. So what do you think is going on here? I guess there are a lot of people having to sell, yeah. and there are a lot of people wanting to buy if it's down to $85,000 again. So, my prediction for 2013, you read it here first. Um, we're actually going to see a small rise in the average selling price of the condominiums in Florida, and the transaction volumes will still be very high because a lot of people either detect a bargain or are distressed sellers still. 
So I think, in the end, you were right, and I was right. <laughs> this is the right place to put your money at least for the next couple of years. Um, although very risky, because we, none of us know anything about it um, beyond the, the data, really, and, and the anecdotal evidence. Right, um, enough of the, uh, um, of the game playing, and indeed uh, of, me, of me talking a lot. I'm going to invite um, two uh, very eminent people that we're very fortunate to have with us today uh, up to the stage. Um, Andy Phelps um, is a relatively recent appointment as Director of BWX at JSN through PLC. Um, he has previously done a number of other roles within uh, the, that retailer um, and indeed started off um, on, on the shop floor. Is that, that right? You were uh, assistant manager and then you also uh, worked through management and then regional management as well. So Andy's seen it, seen it all and he's also seen several other categories in detail and brings with him therefore a very interesting perspective that we're going to share today. Um, Simon McMurtry is the uh, Chief Executive for TrekWise and um, has uh, done that role for the last four years, I believe, um, and um, is, uh, uh, has really been credited with transforming that organisation from one that was uh, primarily UK-based uh, to one that now spans, um, I think it's uh, eight yeah. markets, and um, is doing incredibly well uh, in places like the United States and also Australia, uh, which has had the, mo the wine club model for some time. Um, the brands that you would know, of course, are based on things like Lathwaite, the Sunday Times Wine Club, um, but it also now operates the Wall Street Journal Wine Club. Um, and um, and uh, Simon was just telling me this morning uh, that his uh, Australian operation is uh, achieving uh, re remarkable rapid growth this year, um, and uh, he's very pleased by that. Um, we will ask him about that, but we will also ask him about the future. So if I can ask both of them to uh, join me up on stage um, and take their seats here, and we will kick off. Give them a round. Gents, can you just do a sound check on the microphone, sir? Can you hear me? No. no. Okay. There we go. Is that better? Can you hear me now? No. Simon, do you want to just do yours? Um, are we working? No. no. You can hear our voices. You can hear our voices. Okay. Yeah. If anyone can't can't hear them, um, please let me know. Um, what I'm going to do uh, is uh, just ask a couple of sort of uh, questions about their backgrounds and what they what they've been doing recently, because um, the, the the reasons they're here are actually uh, quite uh, uh, clever. I would like to say, uh, which is both both of them have been thinking quite a lot about the future um, and in quite different ways. Um, so Andy, if I, if I just start with you, um, you know, relatively recent appointee, um, what did you see as the sort of, the kind of challenges that your category faced when, when you came into it? And also just tell us a little bit about sort of the, the other uh, wisdom that you kind of bring to the, to the party from different categories that you've uh, operated in. Good question. Um, I suppose my background is very different. So I've been with Sainsbury's for eight and a half years since I finished university. Um, started on our retail graduate scheme and worked in our stores. And then I've bought a number of different categories. So I've done things like kids' toys, which is highly fashionable, long lead time product. Um, you buy it, you've got to trade it. Kids can have like on the playground one week and then not the next. And then um, I've also. Um, spent time in what we call our meat team, so I've bought things like fresh lamb and fresh pork, so I've dealt with primary producers and understood how primary production and things like balancing carcasses and how we work with our supplier base to ship all the other bits off that doesn't matter around the world, that the English don't eat and the trends within that way. And then I went on to head up our frozen food business. So basically anything that we sell in fresh foods, we sell in frozen foods. So my team dealt with a number of different commodities as well as things like ice cream and hot weather categories and, and how consumers work. So very much more into the FMCG market. And then I went back out, so I went to the west of Scotland and spent four months running the west of Scotland from an operational perspective and um, got spent time before the new legislation came in to understand. <coughs> Uh, Scottish consumer model that we would have and that basically meant managing a group of about 15 store managers um, and how we serve our customers in Scotland where we're only 18 years old so um, and then I have for the last six of eight months headed up what's called beers wines and spirits so um, anything alcoholic for Sainsbury's so my background heavily has been understanding consumers and um, how they are what they want what they're looking for so 
going back to a key question about some of the stuff for the future, the biggest one you would notice if you read any company's results at the moment would be to look at petrol. So if you do like for like with and without petrol, you will notice a very, very big difference in um, what is happening. Um, one thing that I'd always look at and think about is if the consumer's only got £100 to spend a week, so a standard family only got £100 to spend a week, but it's costing five more pounds than they previously used to, to fill up your petrol, you've still got to take your kids to school, you've still got to drop them off, you've still got to go shopping, you've still got to do all the bits and counter in. It's five pounds less out of the basket that they potentially had to spend versus last year because they're spending on petrol or their fuel bills or the cost of running their home is, is going up. So their household income is actually in decline or relatively flat when it's an inflationary marketplace. Um, so for me, in the future, we've spent a lot of time understanding about our consumers and in the alcohol category, understanding what they want, what they're looking for, and we spend a lot of time listening to them. So we have a number of different metrics of understanding consumer behaviour. So it can be anything as simple and as crude as sales data, which I'm sure you as people that run businesses and understand is probably a big metric that you would look at. Um, we then look at things what we call listening groups. So we sit behind glass screens and we ask them lots of questions and understand what's going on. We spend time in our stores doing what we call company shops. So it's one of my favorite places is to spend down the booze aisle, just chatting to customers, understand what they're shopping and why they're doing it. Um, because I'm a standard shopper, but I don't represent 20 million customers that we serve to a week. So understanding different groups of customers is very, very different. We then Based on some of that information, we talk to them in a number of different ways, and that's changing. So, 10 years ago, Facebook wasn't about. We talked to them through Facebook, we talked to them through digital methods, we um, talked to them through something that's very big in America is coupons, and it's very common in America that customers use coupons. And if you think 10 years ago, how big were coupons? But Coupon at Till, which is a system that we use to talk to our customers. So they might buy a product and we say here, look, have 50p off or here's 500 bonus points on your Nectar card when you purchase this product and, and we can specifically target those customers to help them spend a bit more or actually just to reward them so that they stay with us. Um, or you may think about it to stay with your product and how do you reward people so they keep coming back time and time again to those products. So in the future, I think that the customer dynamic and the household spend will still consider be under considerable pressure. And um, I personally believe that they continues to what they've done for the last five years, which is to probably put one item less in the basket and take the discretionary spend <coughs> out. So if you mapped over um, the last 10 years what markets have declined, um, you would see the CD markets in massive decline and most of it's moved to digital. Um, however, there's still a discretionary spend, similar to books, but lots of other areas that you call discretionary spend are actually in decline. So actually, if you just went through and looked at your budget and you thought, right, actually, Greece is just going to get worse and what's happening in the Euros in Europe is, is over the next five years, will that recover? Probably not. And actually, if you're a typical customer and someone that's not in the wine trade and doesn't get it and doesn't understand the product, what, what's happening? And those of you that have budgets that you meet every time you go and shop, I would encourage you to think, how do customers then put wine in their basket or not? And then the other flip side of what we're looking at in trends at the moment is consumer profiles. So there's no coincidence that side is in double digit growth and sweet side is in double digit growth because the consumer taste buds are changing. So um, something we're looking at is how we mirror that or across anything. So I'm not in this room like most of you and only want to know and worry about wine. I want to know and worry about everything that's alcoholic. And I'd also look at the soft drink market and see what the soft drink market are doing to anything drinky, and I'd also think about the tea market and all of that type in those consuming areas. Um, and we spend a lot of time understanding future trends, but my top tip to anybody in this room is to understand the consumer first. Generally, we're all naturally consumers, so try and take your, your, your expert wine hats off and go and understand how they do it, or talk to your friends that aren't in the wine trade and how they shop. You know, in supermarkets here, yeah, we probably sell what 75, 80 percent of, of the wine volume <laughs> in the marketplace. Forgive me if I'm wrong on that fact and that number, but it's it's a large number. And customers like to buy wine that way just because it's easy, because their lives are getting busier. There's more things to do. There's more ways to entertain themselves. Um, 
the other point I noted earlier on is how many of you 10 years ago thought that Pina Grigio would be the top selling grape as Chardonnay was 10 years ago? Is it's, it's probably quite quite low, and that's part of the dynamic and what's happening in the market. So um, we've all got to be very good at forward thinking, but also reacting quickly to what you're seeing. And you do have a natural product that is grown, and it takes you, from what I've learned, three to four years to maybe get certain grapes and to replant and do lots of different things. And you're all experts within it, but that's a big a big a big stretch. And I'll always go back to history and learn about history and then forward think about the future. So, um, kind of, does that answer your key question? Yeah, it does, um, and there'll be more coming. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> uh, Simon, uh, you've had uh, some different challenges to, to face. Yeah, to 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 totally different situation, totally different experience. So Direct Wine is owned by Tony and Barbara Lathwaite, um, mm -hmm. and Tony started the business in 1969, um, and he practically went bust in 1971, and his girlfriend Barbara said, either you let me come and run the business for you, or else you find a new girlfriend. And uh, she became managing director in 1971 and remained so until 1991, so the first 20 years of business. Not many people know that, and she's really the, the brains behind the business. But he, he's the creative force. And, and in 2006, uh, 37 years in, he said, I'm bored. And he, he took the James Bond film title and changed it. He said, for me, the UK is not enough. And he just had an aspiration that the company would go global. And he had no idea what that meant. He'd certainly never made a plan in his life. But when he had in 1969, it had been a disastrous plan, and his wife had had to rescue him. Um, and so he hired me, because I'd uh, taken two publishing businesses around the world. And he hired me to take the Direct Wines business um, internationally. And I said to him, well, do you have any particular aspirations to where you want to go and what you want to do? Not really. So I just want to roll a few dice. Um, I said, okay, fine, that's good. And what we've done is we've rolled a few dice in America, uh, so which was a, a, a fast-growing market, but quite a difficult market from a regulatory perspective. Switzerland and Germany, so well-established wine markets, quite traditional, quite mature, but they drink a lot of wine, especially in Switzerland. Um, Poland, a, a, an emerging market where they wanted to have a slice of what we've had in the Western countries and felt they'd been missing out of. And if you look at the, the statistics, you'll see that vodka sales are in sharp decline and wine sales are in, in sharp growth. Although vodka can decline about 50 years before wine even gets close to it because the consumption is so high. Um, India, in the last year, we placed, we rolled a dice in India. And we're the only direct consumer uh, seller of wine in India. We, we bought a, a, a nascent business there called the Wine Society of India, which, which we control. Um, Hong Kong because we were slightly too frightened to go to China, so we thought we'd go to Hong Kong. But 50% of our customers are actually living on the mainland, and they come across to Hong Kong to collect their wine on the weekend. Um, and Australia, where they drink an incredible amount of wine. So, so we placed these bets around the world, um, and how we mapped the future was uh, we just talked to people. So first of all, I talked to the Lathwaite family, and they've got three sons who are 32, 30, and 28 who were clearly going to be coming to the business to find out what did they want. We talked to our customers in the UK and, and said, well, what, what does Lathwaite do well in the UK and what do we do badly? Because the stuff we do well is what we need to do overseas. And the stuff we do badly, we, we won't attempt to do. And, and what, what we did well was to really know what our customers liked and to look after them really well. The service of Lathwaite, the customer service and delivery is, is absolutely excellent. And the, the UK situation in... Uh, 2007 was pretty unattractive. You had oil prices rising, which obviously means that glass and wine costs were going up. Government was starting to uh, have a big plan to, to tax wine much more heavily, um, which, which they've done consistently. It, it goes up every year by 2% above inflation, which is brutal. Um, the, the competitive environment was becoming much harder. So at the time, 2007 and 2008, Tesco was doing a spectacular job since then, Sainsbury, where a lot of people have, have caught up and maybe even overtaken them in some ways. Um, Majestic's also been doing a great job. Something called the internet came along, and, and when I joined Direct Wines, we had a, a fledgling website, which took 3% of our orders. Um, and in, in the UK, it now takes 50% of our orders. In Hong Kong, it takes 75% of our orders, so you know, the, the web has changed. So the, the, the famous perfect storm is going on in the UK, but, but we were able to understand by talking to our customers and, and really looking very hard at what the competition was doing, where, where our strengths lay and what we could do. Um, 
And then we just gave lots of freedom to the people around the different businesses. So I hired someone to run the US business, the Australian business, the European business, the Hong Kong business. Gave them freedom, uh, money, uh, very clear performance metrics, um, and made sure that we had um, fantastic wine. In 2007, we had good wine, not great wine. Um, and I hired a guy called Justin Hyde Steve from Waitrose to make sure that we up the quality of our wine and we had good wine bars from other of the uh, retailers, including Sainsbury's. Um, and we just we just won today the Drinks Business uh, Wine Buying Team Award, which was, which was great, good recognition uh, for that team. And bit by bit, you know, it's it's all come to pass. So international, when I joined, was zero percent of the sales, and it's now thirty one percent of group sales. So thirty one percent out of <coughs> 360 million pounds comes from international, which is incredibly motivating. Um, and, and what Tony Lathwaite's wife, Barbara, said, okay, Tony got his voice for the first five years. He told you to roll some dice. He said, now it's time for a plan, Simon. Uh, he said, she said, I, I want a plan for the next nine years. I want you to predict the future nine years from now, create a legacy vision for our three sons, so that when Tony and I are retiring, 75, and we're not going before that, in case you think we are. And they're 66 to 65 at the moment, so I've just got my, we put on notice, they're around for the next 10 years. And she's quite tough to work with. Um, we, we've created three 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 year plans, next three, the second three, and the third three, which t takes the business from 360 million up to 550 million pounds over the next nine years. Um, and if you look at all the different countries, you, you can sort of see how it happens. But critically, in that plan, uh, we don't assume any significant growth in the UK at all because we assume the supermarkets will continue to do a great job, Majestic will continue to do a great job. And we're, we're doing fine, we're holding our own, but we've had to create a new plan to do that. We've had to listen very hard to customers who said, make it more personal. When the same person from Lathwaite's calls me up and remembers the conversation they had last time, I buy a lot more wine from them. Make it more relevant. Will you stop offering me white wine, I only ever buy red wine? Or will you stop offering me new world, I only ever buy you know, old world? So getting our customer data is really, really sharp around that. And just letting people buy the way they want to buy. So all of our websites are now mobile enabled, so that when you look at them on a Blackberry or, or an iPhone, they actually look decent and work well, as opposed to just like being a reduced website. It, it's a small thing, but many of the retailers have not mobile enabled their websites, which is really annoying. And, and if you look at the web orders coming in, 42% of web orders now come in over a mobile device. So if someone's done it on a non-mobile enabled device, it's an incredibly frustrating experience. And so in the UK, what, 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 what we, we talk about Mark 1 and Mark 2. Mark 1 is, Mark 1 is what we're running out overseas. The UK needed Mark 2, so it's much more personal, much more relevant, much more differentiated, a lot more technology. And we're doing it sort of very quietly in the background so that Andy and others are not watching too closely, hopefully. Majestic certainly are watching, thank goodness. <laughs> thank you, thank you. And, it, and it, sort of get, it, it gets us gradually towards that future. We're going to talk more about the, uh, the, the, the sort of challenges, certainly sort of as you get further out, uh, Simon, and uh, sort of the technical stuff that you've been doing. Um, and if we can go back to you just for, for, for a minute. Uh, what are the, the key things that you're going to try and do over the next few years? I mean, you said listen to customers, brilliant. You're getting a very good idea of what the demands are. What, what, you know, what, what's your vision? What, what, how are you going to to, to get um, same piece from where it is now to where it needs to be? I suppose we'd look at one uh, very public announcement we've made. It's our 20 by 20 commitment. So we're going to double the sales of lighter alcohol, and we define light as anything beneath 10 and a half percent. And we're going to double the sales of lighter alcohol by 2020. So we've got eight years left to do it. We've already reported that we've grown in the last year by 14%. So we're well on track, slightly above my plan um, for delivering that target. And some of that has come from talking to our customers and saying they do want lighter, but they don't want us to say, stop buying a 14% product and we're only buy five and a half because it tastes completely different. We're also doing it through things like clear on pack labeling and we want to have the clearest labeling of ABV of our products and looking at how we take units, as you may define them, but we'd call it, a, you know, how we reduce the ABV of all of our own brand products and taking that step forward. And it's a very aspirational 
targets. We have other targets within that, which is under our 20 by 20 banner. So there's 20 targets to the by 20 by 20 um, within our company. So we've got things around British, we have things around um, packaging, um, we have things around sustainability. So we've moved all of our walks to the FSC and a sustainable supply chain model for that, so looking at how we build and work with our supplier base in a more sustainable model. Um, is what we work through. So a big lever for us is the lighter product with ten and a half percent for twenty by twenty. Excellent. Um, Simon, I'm sure you know, it's totally it, different. Though, it, 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 we have two different businesses yeah. in the same. I mean, we're obsessed with education and engagement at the moment. You know, we, there's, there's a lot of our customers who are crying out all over the world for more information about wine in the world of wine, the winemakers, you know, just you know, wine and food matching, all, all that stuff. There's lots and lots of people, especially in the emerging markets, the Polish, the Chinese, Indians, hungry for education, and then engagement. There's, there's, you know, you, you, whether you, whether you look, look at Twitter or Facebook, or just any way for people to share with you, and you to do something about, and share with each other, uh, things around their wine experience um, um, and you know companies for years have sort of done things to consumers and we can't none of us can stand it anymore you know we, we're all obsessed with wanting to be buying products and services from companies who listen to us and if they do we give them our business again and if they don't we don't i suppose uh, and this is a question for both of you but simon first uh, you know, we in this room we're dealing with this, this seesaw of what's possible and, and what bad things might happen. How, how are you, you know, when you're planning, in this case, nine years ahead, which is it's an awful long time, you know, what, how do you factor in all of the things that could happen? And also, what information are you using? How are you going to come to that, that point of view that you feel confident about in terms of planning for the future? You need to start outside the world of wine. You just need to look at basic consumer... You know, demographic trends, economic trends, and, and in our case, we look at what's happening with luxury goods around the world. And the, 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 the places that luxury goods are hot today is where wine will be hot tomorrow. You know, and the, the aspirational middle class has, has driven society for a very long time, and that's what's going on in China, it's what's going on in India, it's what's going on in Poland. And so we're, we're looking at that, we're making projections on it. Every number we, we do for nine years from now, we divide by two, every single one. <laughs> yeah, so we, 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 you have to assume that no, nothing will work out quite as well, and that, that still gets us to a nice, nice growth curve. And because we're a privately held company and my family, it's not like we're reporting to the stock market every day or having to answer to a private equity fund. Um, and if we were, there's no way they'd be letting us place bets on the international territories we've placed at the same time. They would say that's. And in fact, Steve Lewis has been quoted in the papers in the last few days of saying, "No, Majestic won't be going to national. Our shareholders would never support it." Much to my relief. And Andy, you, you obviously have uh, almost the opposite problem because sometimes you're judged, well, not just on the yearly numbers, but even monthly, it's, it's weekly, isn't it? It's Monday morning uh, numbers that uh, uh, tend to get you called upstairs uh, uh, if you're not doing what you're supposed to do. How do you balance that off against actually trying to make a plan that, that looks beyond what's happening next week, but uh, say, you know, <coughs> two, three, five years from now? I suppose we, we've just spent the last six months since I've been in a job understanding our long-term strategic piece and that will be everything we do comes from the consumer. So it's about taking our business and our retailers through the longer term goal of what we're trying to do because if they can see it then, then it makes sense and often when you do exactly um, the simplest approach to things they're often the most logical and I find the industries add lots of industry complexity when actually, you know, as consumers, are actually just bog standard people that want it as simple as possible and want to be able to come here, get a great product, learn a bit about it, and go home and feel satisfied. So the the noise, as you may call it, of, of running a business um, that is as large as um, Sainsbury's is, it's just about communicating and. Uh, making sure that all the key stakeholders understand what we're doing and what we want to achieve and our 20 by 20 actually cements that for, for what we're doing but always start at the consumer 
We're very lucky in this room because we, we're all working with a product which lives in the sort of good quartile of people's lives. So if you, if you start to understand it, what do people want from their life in general and, and see yourself up in that top right hand corner, you'll, you'll do fine. And anything around the product or the service which is difficult or painful for the consumer, you, you have to address. And there were, in our case, were things about our delivery service which was not very flexible and you couldn't do the sort of Ocado type delivery slots you can now. We used to force you to have mixed cases where we've mixed all the cases for you. Now you can mix all your own cases. And, you know, all obvious things to give consumer control over what they buy, when they buy it. And, and in our case, a cast iron guarantee, which we changed. We said, if you don't like one of our wines, tell us, we'll give you your money back. Not, not if it's cooked or bad, if you don't like it. And we, we have that all over the world. And it, it gives us a great confidence as a customer. Oh, well, that's fine then. I can try something, oh, I, I tried that new grape variety, didn't like it at all. No problem, here's your money back. Fantastic, there you go. Very reassuring. Um, final question, because I'm afraid we're, we're out of time. Um, and and it, it's to you, Simon, uh, first, and, and then Andy, if you want to add anything. Um, clearly, uh, the world moves on. Uh, you make a plan, uh, things change. Uh, how do you, uh, what processes do you use to try and kind of make sure that you are actually on the right track, that that nine-year plan for the Vincent sign is actually coming to fruition, or if it's not, what are you going to do about it? We, we, we make sure that each of the business heads, each of the who are running the eight different businesses, has a plan B. When we ever do budgets and half-year reviews, they have to show us what the plan B is. And uh, I have a little secret team of six people working for me on sort of cutting-edge innovations. Um, and we normally get one winner a year out of that team, which we can then drop into a particular territory and give us an extra 10 million pounds of sales when we're falling short. It's my secret weapon. Excellent. And have you got a secret weapon? Uh, accountants. <laughs> um, we measure uh, markets, so share, size, growth, um, value, volume um, within our business, customer retention, customer loyalty. So we have what we call our standard financial parameter health check, and then we have a customer health check that I review every four weeks with my team in detail in each of the categories and checking that we're on plan. So I still have a measure, but yeah, we have lots of accountants that do lots of stuff for me too. Thank you both. Um, if you just stay where you are, um, I'm going to uh, call Andrew back up to the stage uh, just to uh, uh, conclude with um, four uh, basic questions, which uh, Simon and Andy and have sort of uh, asked, uh, sort of been asked and kind of helped you with. Um, just to, so that you can actually walk out of here um, with something written down, hopefully, that uh, is going to help you think about the future. So, uh, Andrew, would you mind joining us again? Thank you. Thank you, Richard. Um, I don't know if your minds are like mine, um, but I have ideas going all over the place right now. So what we're going to do now is just ask four questions. I recommend you write down the answers, keep it personal to yourself, just to kind of just narrow down where these ideas are. So I'm just going to read out each question, and I just recommend, I'm not going to collect it in, I don't want to hear your responses, you share them if you like, um, what, the, what your answers are. So first question, where are you going to place your bets in the next three years? <coughs> where are you going to place your bets in the next three years? Second question. What are the main barriers that you're going to need to overcome? What are the main barriers that you're going to need to overcome? Third question. What options do you have to make this happen? What options do you have to make this happen? Finally, what are you going to do next to make this happen? <laughs> so what are you going to do next to make this happen? Thank you very much. It just remains for me to thank um, our panelists, um, Andy Phelps, Simon McMurtry, 
and, uh, and in fact I should have added at the beginning, um, we should congratulate them both for uh, being award winners both tonight, uh, sorry, last night and today. Um, uh, Andy picked up uh, multiple uh, specialist retailer of the year in the inaugural Harper's Awards, um, and Simon's uh, buying team picked up buying team of the year in today's Drinks Business Awards. So, um, as well as thanking them, uh, I hope you'll join me in giving them a round of applause to say well done um, for both of those awards.